Okay, so let's kick this off. Firstly, a warm welcome to all of you who join us in today's session about how to use data to build great games and take them to market successfully. My name is Jonne Rönnqvist and I head up Google Cloud for gaming, esports and media in Sweden, where also our great friends from GLUT come from. Before they come on stage, we have an agenda item to ensure you get some bearings on what Google, BigQuery, and Looker is. With me to do so is Robbie McKiernan, um, Account Executive Nordics in our Google Looker team. Then we will hear from Jamie Dunbar-Smith, Chief Growth Officer, and George Baker, BI Analyst at GLUT. GLUT to me is really an exciting Swedish player in the world of gaming and esports. And today, Jamie and George will give us some real life examples of what it means to put data and analytics into real practice. We will then see a demo by Mike Burke, enterprise customer engineer, also from our Looker team. We will end with the Q&A. And if you want to post a question today to that, just use the Q&A box. But now let's get into data analytics for games. Gaming companies tell us that in this era of free-to-play monetization models and global scale multiplayer real-time games, data has become the true lifeblood of making their game successful. It is used for user acquisition and to provide tailored offers, um, real-time offers to players um, and to improve their experiences of the game, to improve monetization outcomes, and also to share insights across the organization in, across business and development and operations teams, for example. But in the end, data is used to build and run great games that their players love. Now, gaming companies tell us there's a major problem here, and it's around data volume growing significantly and data fragmentation, which makes it difficult and sometimes even impossible to uncover those important actionable insights. And this is while they're being under pressure to produce these insights more and more quickly. The good thing is some gaming companies have already found the solution. Like King, for example, who developed games and franchises. You may probably have heard of Candy Crush or even played it yourself probably. King needed to move from their legacy solutions into a new way to operate data at scale. For them, meaning processing more than 70 billion events per day for 249 million monthly active users. So King turned to what is today Google's smart analytics platform. This platform has two key components we will talk about today, BigQuery and Looker. As you can imagine, these two really work better together, but they also work with other data warehouses and analytics tools as well to meet you exactly where you may be right now today. Let's dig into them a bit. We start with BigQuery. BigQuery will help you capture player metrics globally in an enterprise planet scale data warehouse for analytics. And in BigQuery, you can start with very little data and then you scale it up immensely, if you like, as your game grows. It automatically scales to hundreds of petabytes if it needs to. All of that data is being secured and encrypted by default, both at rest and in transit. Imagine yourself scaling your current data warehouse in, uh, to your next levels and doing so without having to scale your operations to handle that. This is possible with BigQuery because BigQuery is a uniquely fully managed serverless service. But what does serverless mean? Let me spend a minute with you on that. Typically, in a traditional data warehouse, you need to think of a lot of things like resource provisioning, how things are going to scale, availability, uptime tuning things, monitoring, all of this just to have your data warehouse run properly. But with BigQuery, instead, all of this happens automatically for you in the background. 
And you don't have to think about things like how much data storage do I need or how many nodes do I need to allocate to get performance during my best guess for a future peak, uh, peak usage. It's also um, very simple to get going. Just push your data into BigQuery and you query it with your tool of choice. And also for queries, it will understand how to perform. Regardless if your queries are a few hundred kilobytes or 40 terabytes in size. All of this automation here we're talking about is it's really a big thing, especially for those of you who run smaller teams and want to spend your time creating great data pipelines and analyzing the data instead of having to spend all that valuable time managing a lot of machinery in a back end somewhere. Also, running the fully managed serverless BigQuery, you only pay for the storage and compute that you actually use. But there's even more to this. So you can also ingest real-time data into BigQuery, streaming from various systems with BigQuery, making it immediately available for analysis. And there's more. BigQuery has a BI engine in memory layer, which helps you speed up your reporting and dashboarding as well. One final thing I'd like to add is that our customers absolutely love that BigQuery has built in machine learning out of the box. There's no need to spend time and money on moving data around in and out of a separate machine learning environment even. Just run your advanced analytics and predictive analytics right there, right where the data sits. So with this, it should be clear that BigQuery is uniquely capable compared to any other data warehouse you may have worked with. And with that, it sets us up to do some great analysis. Let's hear about that. Over to you, Robbie. Thanks, Johnny. Now let's look at how we can unlock even more insights with our cloud native analytics solution, Looker. Let's introduce you to Looker and what it can do for gaming companies specifically. From our row level drill down features of, of your gaming data to our modeling layer that allows for your business logic to remain in one place, to our great visualizations that allow for end users to ask and answer their own questions of the data. What really drives this for business users has changed and evolved over time. And what matters to business users has changed and evolved. Creatives want to know something that might be completely different to marketing. And producers want to know how best they can optimize their games. This has led to an explosion of applications that all produce the answers to each department's questions, but don't provide insights for everyone in the business. The way Looker is architected delivers robust data experiences to all the departments. And with our pre-built Looker box, it allows you to rapidly deploy and quickly gain insights into things you may have already missed. But what are data experiences? Well, data experiences can represent any number of ways in which a company's, companies drive value from their data. That could be understanding game performance in near real time or accelerating time to insight for optimizing spend or by monetizing game data that has generated new, re new value streams. Looker's platform offers a unified surface to access the truest, most up-to-date version of your data with this unified view that you can choose our design experiences that assure people and systems get data delivered to them in a way that makes the most sense for their needs. The idea of Looker is to serve people the data where and when they spend their day. Looker powers a number of data-driven experiences, beginning with modern BI. Looker's world-class BI experience puts trusted actionable insights into the hands of decision makers and helps cultivate a data culture throughout your organization. But BI is just one experience and a small slice of the company's data strategy. We see gaming companies working with data in very innovative ways, integrating to every part of their business in ways that go beyond reports and dashboards. With fresh, fresh accurate data on hand, it is easy to optimize workflows with data. George and Jamie will go into this in a little bit more detail, but another one of our great gaming companies, Future Play, is a great example of delivering a data-driven experience. Future Play has increased their revenue by 3x by building a fully automated AI powered bid bot that optimizes their ad spend by automatically adjusting bids based on real time performance. 
We see companies building data products, creating new revenue streams from the wealth of data they're already sitting on. They rapidly build custom data solutions from full-blown applications to analytics products for customers or partners. Now I'm gonna go into a couple of examples of how leading companies are delivering data experiences and shifting their focus from traditional reporting tools to platforms that integrate data into business operations and data products. So how, how we start is let's understand game performance in near real time with the ability to look at template BI dashboards that are customized for gaming out of the box. Lots of gaming expertise and customizations brought to the table go from nothing to something very quickly. By democratizing data in your organization, trade are easy to use, business, user, business users can figure out the answers to simple historic questions by themselves, allowing your data analysts to focus on more productive and strategic questions. Dashboards can provide execs with what exactly they, they need, high level to basic level. At analyst level, you can also shorten the time to insights and really save them quite a lot of time. Save them quite a lot of time. Looker can push data to applications you need. We have downstream integrations with tools like Jira and Slack, where we can take control, take action directly from Looker. It's not just a BI tool; it's a control panel for taking action. What Jamie and George will go into um, from a GLU perspective, I hope will show that in great detail. Similar to what Jamie and George will show is what FuturePlay have done with our AdWords integration. And everything I've spoken about in the last few minutes will be on show when Mike takes us through the demo. But for now, I'm gonna pass over to Jamie and George to show you how they use Looker internally at GLoot. But before we do that, I just wanna let you know of some of our top gaming customers that are using both BigQuery and Looker. Jamie and George, over to you. Hello, my name is Jamie. And together with my colleague, George, we've prepared a short story for you today. Before we kick things off, I'd like to say a big thank you to our friends at Looker and Google for inviting us to share this story. I will introduce you to Gloot, share who we are and what we do, bring to life the product experience for you, and then take you under the hood, show you the various tools that our teams use on a day-to-day -day basis to make data-driven decisions. And that is our G-Stack. One of those key tools is Looker. So we'd like to really show you what we do. And that's where I'll hand over to George. George will give you a look and feel for what we use in Looker and what's next on his agenda. So let's kick things off. Who are we and what do we do at GLoot? Well, we're a Stockholm-based esports startup. And for those of you who are not familiar with the worlds of esports, it's electronic sports, the ability to compete in video games to win prize money. And this world is very much an offline world. And it's really limited to specific professionals. To the right over here, you'll see a list of these offline esports events by game. And to focus just on one, the international at the very top, $34 million in the game Dota 2 was distributed to up to 90 players. And we believe this is a problem and a clear opportunity because there are a lot of other gamers out there who would be willing to compete in these competitions. So what we believe is esports should be for everyone. And what we look to do is really make it possible for anyone anywhere in the world to earn money by playing the games they already love playing. And I think this is really important to highlight. We don't make games. We just add that extra layer of excitement on top of the games you already play. And our proposition for esports for everyone is really met through two core brands. Our GLL brand, which is positioned towards the world of online and offline organized esports events, and our fun and social brand, which is very much around the 24 seven play and compete when you want the GLoot brand. And of course, we need to be where the players are. So we're cross platform, PC, mobile, and soon to be console as well. And to give you a feel of what the experience looks like, I thought a short video would help.
So we are a player first experience with that overlay on top of your game. You simply download the GLoot application, run it in the background, just like Dropbox, and we are an overlay to your game, sending you notifications and allowing you to opt into competitions when you want. As you can imagine, we receive a lot of data. And what you see here is our G stack. It's an overview of how our data flows from source to destination. On the left hand side, we have our front end, back end GLoot sources and our third party sources, the likes of Google, Facebook, and other key sources. This data flows mostly through segment to downstream tools. These tools enable our teams to be data driven in the way they advertise, analyze, communicate, and A-B test our user experience. We also store all of our data in one centralized BigQuery warehouse. We use Looker to enrich this data, send it back into segment and to downstream into these tools to further personalize our player experience. If I go one click down, it's really about bi-directional data flow. And this schematic really brings this to life for you. What's really important to highlight is that we have one core ETL pipeline outside of segment. We pull data from Kafka and send it into BigQuery. And from BigQuery, we use Looker to model this game data, creating various events, which we then enrich and send into segment. This is one extremely important use case for us because this data or this event is then used in downstream tools. But that's just one of the many use cases. And George has prepared three for you. So let me hand you over to George because I'm sure you're more interested to hear from him than from me. Thanks for the overview, Jamie. Now I'm gonna take you through a number of looker use cases we have here in GLoot, namely monitoring query costs, monitoring daily KPIs, and identifying cheaters on our platform. So let's dive straight in. As Jamie mentioned, we use GCP and all the data we manage in Looker comes from BigQuery. This specific dash comes from an out-of-the-box module in Looker and was made by some very competent people over at Datatonic. I have three bullet points here that read out-of-the-box, 10-minute setup, and immediate use because we benefited from its implementation on day one. While BigQuery is really good at showing the amount of gigabytes in a per query fashion on the console, it's harder to manage when you have a number of users, growing number of tables, automated reports, dashboards, and services all running at once. So these plug and play dashboards really helped us identify where the money is being spent, which allowed us to make more informed decisions on where to optimize our resources and spend. Aside from the conventional partitioning and clustering that allows you to reduce query volume, and therefore spend in BigQuery, Looker has a great caching policy which lets you have multiple policies and triggers in a single Looker module, which can heavily reduce costs in popular dashboards, and this is super important to us due to the large uh, number of datasets we have to look at. So where do we get this data? I'll briefly touch on our company's core offering, which is essentially online competitions, of which we have three kinds, compete against others sprint, where players compete against a number of other players, to get the most points in a limited time frame, compete against others versus, where players can compete head to head, and challenge yourself solo, where players need to reach a certain target in a game. And we have these challenges across the majority of the 23 titles we have on the platform. As the players play their favorite games, we monitor in game events like knockdowns, assists, and wins to determine the outcome of our competitions. So each team is monitoring some aspect of the core offering I just went over. And one of the first things our team did, and this is probably true for most teams that implement Looker or similar tools, is that we built out a whole bunch of models and dashboards for various teams to be able to see the metrics and data they had been asking for for some time. I'm not gonna go into the learning journey that is LookML, but I will say that it's actually very easy to understand and start building from very quickly. I like to think of it like a markdown language for analytics. It does have its weird conventions like yes and no for boolean and not true false, but everyone has their own tastes. The onboarding was great uh, and allowed us to get through the majority of the topics needed uh, and the more advanced things like caching policies, unit tests and manifest files we were able to set up from the documentation alone fairly easily. But that's all I'll touch upon for now. 
Back to the dashboards, below are two examples, one where we can see the LCM team have a dashboard of various competition metrics such as paying versus free players, entry win ratios, average funds locked and so on, split per game, region or time zone. And in the second dash we're looking at uh, are some C-suite metrics that show monthly cohort level data around revenue, hot retention and churn, which is also split per game, region, time frame and time zone. Now, some of the most useful features we've found in building out these dashboards, besides the monitoring and scheduling of emails uh, and Slack messages, is the dashboard-wide filtering you can set up. The first thing a user does after looking at a dashboard is think about how the metrics they are looking at change when they look at a particular subset of users, and it's not always possible to show the metrics and graph equivalents of all the player subsets that they have in mind. So being able to add these dashboard-wide filters that can automatically update each look based on user input is super useful and really easy to implement almost as an afterthought uh, after dashboard creation. Now apart from the general KPIs, we also have uh, more specialized uh, use cases built around specific strategies that I'll transition into now. One strategy we've adopted is to target specific time zones to optimize the number of competitions to the number of active players based off their peak play times, which we monitor in dashboards like the ones in front of us now. The output of these activities is twofold in that it makes the platform feel more alive to players as it would react to the expected number of players, but it would also ensure that the competitions we have online are as profitable as possible. Another top priority, aside from competition economics, is our anti-cheat initiative, which is cross-functional and requires a data-intensive investigative approach. So why is cheating so important for us to detect and to stop? It's pretty simple. Aside from taking money from the business, cheaters spoil the competition for other players and ruin the overall experience on the platform. How do we define cheating? We define cheating as any activity that gives a player an unfair advantage over an honest player. This could be through in-game hacks like aimbots and wall hacks. It could be through sandbagging, where players of an advanced skill level intentionally play badly on games with tiered competitions to fall into categories with players of lower skill levels. Uh, or by using Smurf accounts, which is similar to sandbagging in that users will start a game from a fresh account and play against first-time players uh, where they can dominate. Uh, and finally, server manipulation, which only happens in a certain number of games, but it's a technique where players can take advantage of a period of time where a server has no or very few players, which allows them, along with the help of a friend, to easily rack up uh, kills, points, uh, and wins. And finally, how do we catch cheaters? Uh, it's quite an undertaking to find one simple way to automatically identify uh, cheaters across all the ways I just mentioned. Um, so until then, we just give, uh, we just try to simplify the manual investigative approach that the current anti-cheat team uh, use to identify cheaters where they will look uh, at the number of data points we have collected on the player level. This could be uh, things around the, the account creation. Does the IP address have a number of other accounts linked to it? This will only tell us so much as a lot of our players can come from colleges, uh, college dorms and internet cafes. So we can also look at other things like their win-loss ratio and how it compares to the average player. We of course would attract players of a high skill level, but using a combination of game domain knowledge and basic statistics like standard deviation, we can get a good idea if their skill level falls within the expected level within that game population. But that alone is still not enough as we attract some very competent players, and we don't want to deter honest players with a high skill level as those are likely our highest retained. So we take a look at the game round duration, and what you're looking at here in the right side is a uh, game round duration on the y-axis with the uh, min, max and interquartile range of the game round duration for all games on the platform. I think it's pretty special in that no other company would have this data, uh, at least not for this amount of games. Uh, so a lot of cheating activities would try optimize for winning as many games as quickly as possible. 
So being able to compare the average round duration of a player under investigation to the general population of players goes a long way in order to show if a player is cheating or not. So you can see that we've come a long way since we had our Looker induction in February and have built out numerous projects, models and dashboards. As is the case in most places, a number of these projects were rushed, maybe didn't use best practices in all cases, which resulted in duplication of code, inefficient queries and areas with poor structure. So our current focus right now is on a large scale refactoring of our models. These processes are always quite tedious and definitely not the highlight of any BI developer's work, but with the GitHub integration, we can be sure that all this work done is without any downtime across the dashboards we've used for the teams that, re that rely upon them. Uh, and if we can rely on the unit testing features, we can also be sure that the newly refactored code doesn't result in any unwanted change in the metrics we report on. So even though it's not the most glamorous task, we know that we're pretty confident in the eventual outcome of it. So that's it from us at GLUT. Thanks for listening. And I guess we'll move on to the questions now. Thank you. Great. So thanks for that, Jamie and, and George. And I, I think that was a, a really good insight to see how kind of GLUT are using the power of BigQuery and Looker to kind of get best in class analytics uh, for their business. And I guess what I want to talk about now is, is, is a little bit more of a kind of a general kind of look at Looker, kind of a uh, deep dive into Looker and looking at how Looker can be used for, for maybe more of a gaming developer focus. So yeah, as you can see here, uh, this is this is Looker, and it's it's comprised of kind of three key layers, which is the browse, the explore, and the develop. The browse layer is very much the landing layer of Looker, and it's where we store all our our our, our visualizations and our dashboards and our our looks. All of these are made from the explore layer, and this is a layer that's that's quite different uh, for Looker, but with other BI tools, and it's it's that self service layer, and it's where our non technical users can use a drag and drop interface to kind of drag and drop different dimensions and measures and kind of build their own analytics, ask and answer their own questions. And both of those layers are fed by the develop layer. And the develop layer is where we tell Looker how to write SQL against our database. So how to define the dimensions, define the measures, join the tables together, basically creating that model, that single source of truth that feeds the other two layers. OK, so as we can see here, we've kind of built out a, a model of, of what a kind of a typical high level gaming dashboard might look like. Important thing to note with Looker is that it's a live connect tool. So we're not extracting you know, large data sets into our in memory, which is hugely important when you're dealing with, with gaming. Because as you can imagine, um, with events driven data in general, you're just dealing with massive, massive volume. So it becomes very hard to visualize that data uh, in, in kind of standard extract BI tools without doing some level of aggregation. Um, and then, of course, you lose that granularity. You lose that ability to get to maybe a user level or an event level uh, detail. So with Looker, uh, our kind of infrastructure, we're naturally architected for a, for a, big, data, for a big data solution. Uh, so when you have a great database like BigQuery sitting underneath, where you're storing all of that good event data, you, you can layer Looker on top of that and kind of leverage the power of that BigQuery database. So leveraging the power of all that data you've got stored in there. OK, and as you can see here, we've kind of built out a couple of the standard metrics that you know would be, would be typical for a gaming company. So this is actually built on top of a, a, a Firebase schema. And you can kind of get this out of the box very quickly with a Looker instance if you also use Firebase into a BigQuery. It's a very common schema in, in kind of the gaming development world. And we've built out areas around kind of top line KPIs, user acquisition. As you can see here, this I always enjoy this area. It's kind of giving you a really quick insight into where we're acquiring our users from, you know, our installs by day, but then also our install sources. So of the marketing campaigns that we're running, just a couple of standard metrics across the board. And kind of an important point with this is allowing end users to drill in a bit. And that's a, a key feature with Looker. So you can see here at the top on our global filters, we have the ability to drill in by whatever metric you want. So in this case, maybe country. When, when someone clicks on a metric in this database, I want to drill down by country. So we can just run that. You can see we're getting a quick refresh of our, of our visualization and of our, of our whole dashboard. 
And what this will actually mean now is when I click on, you know, this 56% return on ad spend for iOS iron source, it's now going to take those metrics and split them out by country. So that's obviously something you're going to want to drill into. 56% isn't great. And Looker is going to spin up a visualization on that drill down. So it allows us to quickly focus in. For example, we can see our total marketing spend, spending a lot of money in China, Russia, the US. And then if we focus in on our return on ad spend, for example, we can see that the, the ROAS on those actually isn't great. Uh, for example, in China, where we were spending, you know, about 7K, we're actually only getting a 46% return on that. So really not good enough. Definitely something you're going to want to focus in on a little bit more. So then what a typical business user might do is, is just come back up to these top filters and now filter the whole dashboard. So now, you know, I actually want to just look, focus in on China iOS because there's clearly an issue there. We'll filter on country is China. We'll filter on platform is iOS. We'll give that a run. And once again, Looker's live querying that database. So bringing back those most recent results all the time. So very powerful when you're, you want to give your end users access to a, a live analytics platform because Looker is layered on top of that database. And you can see here that you know all of our metrics are getting filtered for that. So now we're focusing in on China. We can see there's that overall ROAS under 100%, so definitely not where we want to be. If we scroll down a bit further, we can see, yeah, there's that 46% that for iron source. But now rather than drilling on the metric, let's drill down on the dimension itself. So let's just focus in on iron source. And let's look at all the campaigns that we're running in iron source. So actually splitting it out by a lower level of dimension. And then rather than visualization, let's look at this one at the table. And there we can see all of our campaigns and then all of our metrics. And we can see very quickly that these two campaigns at the top are the two problem campaigns where we're spending accumulatively, you know, that's 7K, but only getting about 3K in return. And in particular, this 35% uh, campaign, you know, just really probably isn't good enough. And then the final thing with Looker uh, in this kind of example is using our RESTful API to take action on that. So using our RESTful API that we are sitting in our backend to push out an API call to a different part of your tech stack to take action on that metric. So for example, anywhere where there's been three dots built in, you've allowed someone to go and take an action on that. So we can hop in here and go and manage this campaign in Iron Source. You could also build in buttons here to pause the ad campaign in, in Google AdWords, or you know, go in and stop the ad campaign in Google AdWords, or whatever it may be. Any part of your tech stack that can receive an API call, you can build a looker action to either do it on an ad hoc basis or automate it. Like what a some of our our kind of more advanced customers have done is set up a kind of a model to predict return on ad spend, and then based off of that model have Looker actively go and turn on or off or bid up or down on those ad campaigns. So having Looker automate whole workflows depending on the output of these kind of these metrics or these models. OK, and then of course, finally, just on the browse layer before I move on into the Explore, just the ability to either schedule out these dashboards if you want to. Maybe you just want to receive this dashboard rather than coming into Looker. A very common one can be a Slack channel or you know, straight into a Google Drive um, you know, on a scheduled basis, once a day, once a week, whatever it may be. Or of course, if maybe you just want to get an alert on it instead, then maybe you just want to know whenever your, your daily installs for China iOS, so we still have those filters at the top there, click on one of these bells and go, I just want to know whenever it goes greater than 500. I want to get an email you know, on a scheduled basis. So having Looker take care of a lot of the more mundane tasks. So that's the dashboarding. But then where Looker can start to get you know, quite different and quite unique compared to other BI tools is in our ability to explore from here. And that's where on any one of these metrics, if you want to dig a little bit deeper, you can explore from here on any of the tiles. And that's going to bring you over to the Explore layer. And the Explore layer is that drag and drop interface that your end users can use to pull together their own analytics. 
So you can see here on the left, we have all of our tables, and on the right, we kind of have the drag and drop UI. So we might just remove that China and that iOS. And we're also looking at one game for now in the past 30 days. We're looking at our day 14 retention rate there. Maybe you've heard, you know, some specific thing like, you know, certain types of iPads have, have different retention rates. So you maybe want to kind of either optimize your app or maybe communicate to the marketing team, but you want to prove that hypothesis first. So what you might do is you might want to filter on the device platform. So you only want to look at iOS because as I mentioned earlier, you, you know, you want to only look at only iPads. And then what we'll do is bring in that device model. But we also want to filter on that as well because we only want to look at it where it contains the word iPad. We'll give that a run. And here's the important thing, that when I press run and when I was dragging and dropping, if I head over to the SQL tab here, Looker was generating SQL based off of my question. So it was kind of bringing that device model. You have defined in your model how to write the SQL for day 14 retention. So Looker knows that whenever you drag in day 14 retention, this is the SQL to write. It knows how to do all the where clauses, but nothing your end users need to understand. They don't need to understand how to calculate that metric or what's going on. They just get their, their analytics, they get their results, and then they visualize how they want to visualize. We have all the classic visualization options you'd expect from a good BI tool. And you can see very quickly, there is a trend in our, in our retention rates for iPads. The, the main iPad has a good retention rate. As we move through to the minis, we can see the mini the iPad minis have kind of a poor retention rate, but then the iPad Pros have quite a strong retention rate compared to those minis. So definitely a trend there. What could this suggest? It could suggest that maybe your games aren't optimized for smaller screens. Maybe it suggests that the more serious gamers uh, probably buy iPad Pros, and therefore maybe you want to you know, get your marketing team to do more kind of specific marketing towards iPad Pro users. A lot of insights that could be drawn from this, but the whole idea is that your end user is able to get to this in that piece of analysis quickly and easily, and also in a very trusted way, in that the SQL that's being kind of generated for them in the back end is fully controlled by your development team. And to kind of give you an example of that, let's just build up another really quick piece of analysis, which is you know by event date for the last seven days, I want to get together just total revenue. So you'll drag in your total revenue there. And you can see that Looker was generating SQL as I was dragging and dropping, as I mentioned earlier. But this time there's a calculation going on where Looker knows that whenever someone drags in total revenue, the SQL to write is in our purchase revenue, plus add revenue, and then sum that together. How does Looker know how to write that SQL? Well, your developers have defined that in the model. And we can take a really quick look at the model to kind of just get a feel for what's going on there. So let's go to LookML. And this LookML area, it's specifically for your developers. Your end users don't come in here. And this is where you tell Looker how to write that SQL. So the very first thing with the modeling layer is that it's fully Git version controlled. So when I turn on development mode, it means I'm activating my own personal branch of Git. Uh, so it means every developer is going to have their own personal branch of Git. You can see now I'm in a sandboxed environment. I'm in development mode. There's a full Git versioning workflow where I can validate my code. I can push it to production. And uh, you can also you know, add in extra tests into that Git versioning as well. So basically full Git functionality with a full Git repository sitting behind it. And then on the left side, you can see we have views and models. So every view, you can just think of as a table in your database. In this case, we just have our, our events view. And then the models are how those tables join together. I wouldn't think of LookML as a new language. It's heavily based out of SQL. If you understand SQL, you're going to pick up LookML very quickly. And it's, it's essentially just a markup language around, around SQL. So as you can see here, what you do inside these models is you start to build those explore layers. So remembering earlier when we were in this explore layer where we had the drag and drop interface, it was called events. And here's actually where you built it. 
So you built out a, a new explore called events. Whenever anyone joins in something from session facts, you've told Looker how to join that. Whenever anyone joins in something from user facts, you've told Looker how to join that. So basically building out that model that's telling Looker how to kind of write that SQL. And then on the view layer, every column within that table is created as a dimension. So you can see here, you told Looker, I want to create the event sessionized table and create it as a view. Looker has gone away and scanned every column in that table and created it as dimensions. But remembering that we're not actually extracting the underlying data, just using that metadata because we don't extract, we're not an extract tool. So a lot of this is generated for you, all the columns being turned into dimensions. And then you also add your business logic on top. And to, to give you an example of that, I want to show you that total revenue that we were looking at earlier. So let's just find that total revenue. There you go. You see here we've made a, a new dimension called combined revenue. It's a number, and there's the calculation for it, in-app purchase revenue plus ad revenue. And then there's the measure which is the total revenue, which is a sum of that combined revenue field you've made. The great thing about Looker's model is how flexible it is, in that if you then want to edit that dimension, there's not a big workflow around changing those dimensions. If you kind of want to take into account the, the kind of the, the cost that the app store might take, so you want to multiply in a purchase revenue by 0.7, there's no big workflow around making that change. You can just save your change quickly, and then if I head back to the Explorer to show you how quickly that change is implemented, if I press Run here, you'll see how quickly that change is worked into the calculation. So you don't need to kind of reach out to different teams. You don't need to change every dashboard with that metric. You just change the modeling layer, which feeds everything. And then that change flows across anywhere where that metric is used. And that at a very high level is how our model works. So we define a single source of truth, a kind of this is how data is consumed within the business, which then flows into the Explorer layer and flows into the Browse layer. So that's a, a very, very kind of brief overview of, of how Looker kind of flows from top to bottom. Uh, I hope you've, you've been asking loads of questions into the, into the question box and uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers and now we'll take any questions you guys have.